with Murray Edwards here. Um, in the summer before my research fellowship started, so in the autumn of 2019, I travelled to the western shore of Windermere with um, Dr Michael Malay from the University of Bristol, and we travelled to the Freshwater Biological Association. Um, and this photo actually shows Michael's hands presenting a case um, containing the two separated valves of a margotifera margotifera, which is a freshwater pearl mussel. Um, and with a similar gesture, uh, my current research is attempting to assemble a case, um, which I suppose is less of an argument and more of a kind of container for a poetics of shells, for exploring what bivalve life might be um, as a kind of model for thinking about solitude and sameness and survival. Um, and I should explain this project has come out of, or perhaps it's more accurate to say it's kind of dissolved into my doctoral research, which explored writing that was written in situ, um, largely in the dark, in caves by poets and artists. And where that project explored the cave as a site of extraction and exhaustion of material, uh, my new work kind of shrinks that same space um, and these same mineral materials because both the cave and the shell are openings formed drip by drip, layer by layer from calcite. Um, so in a way the dark cave and the iridescent interior of the shell are continuous spaces. Um, <laughs> you see, I'm speaking to you today from my office um, in Murray Edwards, which is less less iridescent and maybe more fluorescent, um, but it's a very bright interior. And um, at the start of the pandemic, all of our teaching rooms were measured and we were advised on the number of people who could safely gather in each of them according to distance guidelines, whether it was six or three or two. And bewilderingly, the calculations for my room, this room, returned as a zero. So in truth, I'm not sure, I never have been sure if I'm even allowed to be alone in here. Um, and it's in this strange, impossible solitude that I've been thinking about um, shells in this idea of a room of zero. Um, and so what I'll be talking about a little bit today is, is about that idea of, of the shell and the hollow and the zero. And I'll explain a little bit more about that here. So um, I've been reading um, the work of Baston Gashlar, the philosopher who holds up a shell as a way to think about words. Words are clamour filled, shells, he writes. There's many a story in the miniature of a single word. <laughs> and I thought, okay, let's let's try this, Gaston. So I began prizing open the word shell. Um, and inside shell, we find the old Norse, old Norse skell, uh, which in turn contains the roots for older words, largely to do with cutting and splitting and halving. And so um, the, the word bivalve, however, comes from the Latin for twofold, twofold. So we have shell meaning um, a halving and bivalve meaning a kind of doubling. So if bivalve means to multiply by two and a shell is to divide by two, then forgive me, <laughs> I might scribble a quick arithmetic of bivalve shell as bivalve shell, um, which in words is to say times two over two. And if I were a mathematician, um, and forgive me any mathematicians who might be in the audience, I might write it as this uh, times two over two. Um, and you can place whatever you want in those parentheses, in those brackets, because nothing will happen. You could put a huge number in there or a, even a, you know, a live dove or an entire ocean, nothing will harm it. It will be cut in half having already been put back together. Um, <laughs> it's like a magic trick. But in other words, to say bivalve shell is to say nothing at all. Um, and I assume Bachelard might have gone through a similar calculation, finding everything and nothing in the shape of a shell. Um, and he, shells are what he describes as daydreams of refuge. And he says, therefore, every hospitable hollow is a quiet shell. And this is what he calls the isomorphism of restful space. And isomorphism is a kind of what you might call a kind of lossless transformation. One thing becomes another without losing anything, without rupturing or tearing. And to demonstrate this, Gaston Bachelard turns to another Gaston, um, and he quotes the opening lines of Gaston Puel's 1956 poem, Ce matin je dirai, which uh, Jolas translates as, he is sleeping. <laughs> 
an almond, the boat like a bed espouses sleep. And in Bachelard French, um, all these spaces are described as coquille or shell-like. They all share that isomorphism of restful space. We have the sleeping man in his boat. We have the almond feeling a little droopy in its droop. And a droop is a fruit that contains a shell. Um, so in English, the exterior of the boat and the exterior of the almond are both described as a hull. And there's something in this polysemy of how an almond shell might expand to enclose a man dreaming of almonds. Something about that transformation, that losslessness, which defines the shape of the next poem, which um, takes its title from Bachelard's line, a man, an animal, an almond, all find maximum repose in a shell. A man, an animal, an almond. In The Poetics of Space, Maria Jolas writes, Gaston Bachelard writes, every whole is isomorphic with every other whole and holes in general are indistinguishable from shells. A shell is a hole we secrete from our body to protect our homemade body, not a void, but a getting into a hard sweat, just being alive. A man, an animal, an almond, all find maximum repose in a shell, goes Jolas, tunefully unfolding the sentence like a squeeze box, pulling the beginning of an animal out of the end of man, tweezering the almond out of the animal with a sweet toot. You think you could push the instrument shut and hold the whole man of almond quietly now in your one hand or you go on pulling the bellows apart until the fabric tears and the man tumbles out of the animal, out of the almond, holding your hands wide as they go, like you're closing the show. You'll take your bow and your chances. On the ground before you, you find a man, an ale, an old. In this poem, torturously drags a man and an animal and, al and an almond and through themselves, finding out what is lost and what is left when a man leaves an animal and leaves the almond. Um, so an animal without man is an ale, an almond without man, there is an old. And another version of this poem came out of a kind of different transformation. Um, which is perhaps more true to that idea of the isomorphism as a lossless transformation, a lossless process, where every part of one thing survives in another, which you might also call an anagram. Um, and here we have a man, is an, a man, whereas an animal might be transformed into lamina, an almond might be transformed into old man without anything being lost. And I'll read that poem at the end. But before we arrive there, I want to take us back to Windermere, where um, hopefully you'll be able to now see uh, the tanks at the Freshwater Biological Association's hatchery. Um, and this is on the shore of the lake where researchers are taking care of an arc of juvenile freshwater bar mussels. And I should say that the oldest mussels in the hatchery are 11 years old. Um, and they're almost ready, almost old enough, almost strong enough to be reintroduced to the River Brathe, which is a tributary to Windermere, where the youngest mussels are over 70. And there's a population which is aging um, and not replacing itself um, and aging towards total disappearance. Um, let's have a look in these tanks. If we take a closer look, you can see what a mature mussel looks like. They grow very, very slowly, um, almost like a rock, hardly an animal at all in that sense. And they can live for hundreds of years. Freshwater pearl mussels exhibit what is called negligible senescence, which is to say they don't show signs of aging. Um, they get older, but they don't age. And they can theoretically live forever, but they, they don't, um, because acting as water filters, the mussels are they're critical markers and they're also critical makers of a river's health. They are filters um, and they are really important to um, the, the, the 
cleanliness of the river's water. Um, and I'll explain a little more about how, how they are um, complicatedly enfolded in the life of salmon and trout. Um, but because they're so vulnerable to very small changes in temperature or acidity or even the strength of the current in a river, it means that in the UK, freshwater pearl mussels are simultaneously almost immortal uh, and almost extinct at the same time. And, um, and in the hatchery, I um, managed to see these newest mussels uh, under the microscope. And I want to give you a sense of how small these things are. Um, these mussels are only a day old at this point, um, which also they're also only a millimeter wide. Um, and when I say they're a day old, they've actually been um, spending the last nine months in the gills of a trout where they um, gestate as glaucidia. Um, and so they have a kind of symbiotic or probably more accurately a parasitic relationship with the trout um, developing in the, in the gills until they are uh, mature enough to drop into hopefully fresh, clean gravel where they will then grow for the next 200 years uh, into mature mussels. Um, but to give you an idea of what they're like when they're only 24 hours old, I need to switch magnification levels um, and show you up close that these baby mussels kind of look like grains of sand. Um, and I was transfixed by how they looked like they might be made of glass or sand at the same time, as if it was possible for them to exist either side of this kind of transformation as sand sintering into glass or glass splintering back into sand. And I should also show you how, um, how these muscles move, because they're so much livelier than you might expect. Um, they're in real time in this video. Um, and you can see at some points they're see-through muscular feet emerge from their shells and they're kicking around for a sense of scale they're kicking around a trout's scale um, a scale for scale um, and it will be another decade before these tiny um, muscles will be a return to the river where perhaps they might survive and live for the rest of their life which is obviously to say the rest of my life and the rest of my life and the rest of my life again and again um, and I suppose if the fresh, if the shell has been helping me while I've been writing here in this, in this room of zero, it's perhaps because the shell extends completely beyond my ken. A bivalve's lifespan is so far beyond my sense of scale, um, both in smallness and longevity. Um, and so here, I want to turn to another poet briefly um, for help. Who, um, and I, I'm going to be quoting Anne Carson. Um, who's writing on the word oikios, the ancient Greek word for something belonging to the house from oikos, which is the broader term for the house. It's been really useful to me in thinking about these kinds of restful spaces that Bachelard talked about, that we share with shells, that we share with salmon, that we share with the brown trout and the whole rest of this bright house. And Carson writes about oikos and how it refers to both the house and the household who dwell in it. Um, and Carson highlights oikios contains both this idea of property, but also of kinship, things that are mine and like mine. And there's something anagrammatic here for me, something isomorphic here in this relationship. Um, but for Carson, this, this uh, word clarifies for her what she describes as the logic of the lover, the logic of what is mine and what is like mine. Um, and I should also point out that oikos is also the root from which we derive the English prefix for ecology. And so this lover's logic, as Carson describes it, can really help plot what we might think of as the isomorphic or transformative relationships between love and loss um, in terms of human and non-human kinship. Um, Carson writes that if we follow the trajectory of love, we consistently find it tracing out this same route. It moves from the lover towards the beloved, then ricochets back to the lover himself in that hole in him unnoticed before. Who is the real subject of most love poems? Not the beloved. It is that hole. And tracing that same trajectory, I ask myself, who is the real subject of my project? And to paraphrase Carson, perhaps I should say it's not the shell. It is that hole. 
it's that zero, that iridescent idea of everything and nothing, of immortal bivalves and of catastrophic species loss. I realise what I'm writing in my bright hollow <laughs> is a kind of exhausted love poetry. And so I want to um, end my talk with um, my final poem, which is a longer poem, which is called A Man, an Animal, a Lamina. And this was written after visiting the River Brathy. A man, an animal, a lamina. Waist deep in hard rush, arriving like a brief river bailiff, pushing my boot through the disturbance. Oh, 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 oh. To find the river is dead in their bed, poor thing, it's a shame, I say, and bend over the lost, wet handset of a freshwater mussel, ringing, ringing, no one from the gravel. Hello, hello. Is no one gonna pick that up? I tut at a rock. Recite the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981, Schedule 5, to a bloom of lime. Sticky westerly, run off. A dead muscle is six months or a fine, I clarify for the benefit of the dead river. I put two fingers to the skin of the water. Ah, shame, I think. Ah, I'm possessed. Ah, blessing, ah, reading, ah, sentence. Oh, this river is uncommonly warm. If I close my eyes, this feels like touching zero rivers or myself. I sing, ah, 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 ah. Recalling the air into me like a hazardous toy. And as much as I can take into my out of town storage unit where I can hold it until incineration, I gulp the air. Not your uncommon ungarden shame, this. Ah, a shame, sure. But when I say I am ashamed, it is to say that I am without shame. Ah, privative, ah, productive negative, to go without feeling or food or light or language to produce ah, apathetic, ah, atrophic, ah, aphotic, ah, aphasic, ah, thing to plug each hole, like digging a hole out of water. I'm nothing but human. Ah, doubling, ah, animal, ah, animal. I dip my shoulder and pull the river over my head, sit in the knackered dark water, hold my breath like a handful of earth in my mouth, baroque pearls of air out of my nose, ah, ringing in my ear, the muscle, the river's old receiver still ringing like a tree, ah, ring, ah, ring, arises, we all fall down, a river, a wood, a shell, ringing out each year, same shape as the last, the first fast as a lump in the shell, because a muscle grows from the umbo, held like a torn index finger to the navel, while the body goes on building another body to wrap the baby up in, like, oh my days, oh, alive, alive, oh, isn't she lovely, oh, good grief, oh, hell, oh, never mind, oh, this life of slow radiance, hard times, the umbo draws the line, the lip will take a hundred years to say. I laugh good naturedly, but I can't say how this ends when the end isn't a point, but a perimeter, and I am sat dead center. Airing, airing out my ringing body, ah, river, ah, wood, ah, shell, ah, ah, ah. All of it so highly prized open. I hear small bones shaking in my ear. No sound just yet. Just this disturbance in the water. Precious little pressures on the drum of my own dumb umbo. The give in the skin where the poem gets in. Where this hinge in the ear between my head and my here has the same two notes as this hinge between shell and shell, my umbo to umbo, animal to lamina, a ring, a ring, a ring to grain, grain, grain. I listen harder as I zip up the river 
into my makeshift body bag, jimmying loose any last pearls and rolling the moon in a little oil to improve its luster. Thank you so much. That's the end of my talk and the end of my poems. I'll stop sharing my screen now. So we can perhaps talk to each other. Thank you very much, Holly. That was that was lovely to listen to. I'm afraid people can't talk to each other because it's a webinar, but they can submit um, questions through the chat. Um, so if anybody's got any questions, please do put them forward. All right. No, we haven't got any yet. Um, I quite like the idea of a negligible, what, how did you pronounce it? Neg negligible senescence. Negligible senescence. I had no idea that they, um, that, that mussels lived quite so long. Um, Freshwater pearl mussels in particular. Right. It's, it's their, yes, that species. Okay, I've learned a bit of science, if not any <laughs> poetry. Um, any questions, anybody? Okay, so we have one from Vic Health, um, who wonders how your interest in this area began. Oh, thanks, Vic. Do you, do you mean in, in the shells or in the cave, I guess? Because for me, the, the same project. Could I ask you to, or maybe you, maybe you mean both? I should explain, I suppose, where my interest in caves began was um, a very long time ago, um, finding um, a book um, written by a poet called Doug Oliver, it's called In the Cave of Suicession, which was um, is a, is a poetry book that was written inside a cave. The claim is that it was written entirely inside the cave. And I read this when I was quite young and I was very taken with the idea of writing a whole book in one night, in one place. And that's where it began. <laughs> um, and with, in particular with this project, I have um, Michael Malay to, to thank for that and his invitation to join him on his journey. He's writing um, a, a bigger project uh, that explores faceless extinction. And his work is really fascinating. So if you're interested in this more broadly, I'd direct you to Michael's work. And I can see Vicky meant both, so I hope I've answered that. <laughs> I can see Francesca's asked about site-specific writing and the question of what happens to a poem after you've left. It's a really, it's a really tricky one. And I think um, there are poems that are written for particular places. Uh, are embedded in those places. There are then poems that are written inspired by places, and I'm quite particular about the distinction between those two things. Um, and so in terms of how much do you redraft after you've left that place, that would change the poem, I think, from one that's been written on site to one that's been written from site, I guess. Um, and certainly the poems that I've read to you today weren't written <laughs> <laughs> weren't written in the river. <laughs> um, although, if I can point you towards some poets who have done that, um, there's a poet called Anna Selby who's written underwater wearing scuba diving gear and waterproof paper. Um, and um, Sean Borrowdale has written an entire collection called Asylum, which was written using a dictaphone um, in the caves under the Mendips. So there are, <laughs> there are poets who certainly take that much more seriously. <laughs> I can see, um, oh, sorry, Francesca, there's a second part of your question. What role images and, uh, so Francesca's asked what uh, role images and photos play in my writing. Um, it's a really interesting question. Um, certainly in terms of, documenting a site. It would take a lot of photos. Um, and I do, I, this is a, this would need a longer answer than I think any of us could stand tonight, but certainly I write in a very visual way and I have written poems that are in themselves end up as images. So there are some projects that would end up or always begin um, with the image. So I'm not sure that answers that question, but <laughs> Certainly, they're, they're in terms of a role, a quite central role. 
Um, I can see that Ruth has asked the question of whether these are going to be in a pamphlet or in situ by the river <laughs> mussels themselves. Um, Ruth, I have a, a mischievous answer to that question, I guess, in that I'm really interested in how um, both in caves and mussels, the way that um, they are formed um, in layers of calcite, those layers record um, changes in temperature and changes in um, essentially climate data can be recorded in, the, in both structures. And so I'm really interested in how mussels and, and bivalves write themselves. So a kind of writing inside the shell. So I think if I were to add a poem in situ <laughs> with the mussels, it would be superfluous. I'm really interested in how a mussel writes itself. Um, but thank you. It's a really generous question to suggest these might be a pamphlet. I would be excited about that. Um, and Salian has asked whether this is a product of lockdown and it is uh, certainly um, in that I began my research fellowship here um, just as uh, I had one term before um, the first lockdowns. So uh, most of my, my research here has been um, very heavily influenced in thinking about uh, what it means to be um, writing in solitude and writing um, in small confined spaces, although I've yet to try and climb into a shell. So maybe that's yet to come. <laughs> um, let me see if I can see any other. Have I missed any questions, Jane? Mm, I don't think so, no. Oh, there's one about um, does the um, poem transform the place for you? Ah, is this, um, could you tell me who? Ah, is this from Avila Center? Yes. Oh, thank you for that question. Um, does a poem transform a place? Um, huge question. <laughs> I think um, in terms of whether or not this a poem belongs into the in the place, whether it um, is left on site, then certainly materially, that that's a, a really important question. Um, and it's to take your take your question maybe too literally, but say a project like Simon Armitage's Stanza Stones, where the poems are truly inscribed in the surface of the landscape, quite different to perhaps what you mean. But I'm certainly interested in that of how how writing um, inscribes itself into the surface of our experience of that place, um, whether or not that's different or um, whether it's um, less so. Um, I can see that the uh, balance levels on my on my screen are making me look like I'm truly in the most iridescent space right now. <laughs> it's very bright in here suddenly. Um, I'm having a look through uh, the questions. Are there any? Emma's asked a very interesting question. How would you describe your relationship with muscles? Um, Hmm, what a fascination, definitely. Um, I was going to say envy. There's something about being able to enclose yourself, um, <laughs> zip yourself up. But I think um, there's something about that enclosure, which is also, I think, through my research, I realized a form of exposure in that these are very vulnerable creatures. Um, but I think uh, it has led to me looking for muscles in places where you wouldn't expect them. There's, um, in my local park at the bottom of the lake, there's swan mussels, huge, size of a shoe, growing there. Um, so I have become quite fascinated with them. Um, uh, Maria's asked an important question of whether the olfactory comes in. Certainly, in a, I mean, these are really <laughs> questions that I've never asked myself. So I'm really grateful to you all for thinking about these. Um, absolutely, in the in, in the in writing on site, it's a, a fully immersive experience. So yes, um, and there's something about muscles in particular that where um, they are 
they're in the gravel, they're in the base of the river, they are, they are doing the work of filtering the river. So it's quite an overwhelming smell um, when you're in the river, waist deep in it, um, wading around. So yes, <laughs> um, it's, it's a, a poem that, um, yeah, brings, brings with it the imprint of that place. Um, it's a really interesting question. Um, Katrina's asked, do you ever take your poems back to the place or space which inspired them and recite them and read them there? Does that feel different? And I wonder what that would do or what that would achieve. And I, I wonder um, whether you'd be taking it there to address the site. But there's something about how doing that, you're going back to a different place anyway, um, to the one that you uh, had visited, whether it's because the time of day or the weather or um, vast amounts of time, <laughs> uh, perhaps bivalve scales amount of time has passed um, or even a moment. So the idea of taking a poem back um, complicates the idea of what sight is, I think, and why, why we write on sight, what we think we're doing when we do that, whether we think we're doing something monumental, um, constructing something that will stay there, um, that might be perhaps like a signpost or a sculpture, um, or whether we think that we're taking um, a sample, perhaps, in the same way that you might take a sample of air <laughs> um, for testing later. It's an interesting question, um, but a more straightforward answer, Katrina, is I, I haven't taken my poems specifically back, although there have been projects where performances have have meant that I've performed the same poem in the same place in drastically different conditions. Jane mentioned that I uh, performed a series, uh, performed in a in a um, a shell grotto, and during that performance, the um, weather changed from bright sunlight. Uh, I did twelve performances over twelve hours, and so we moved from bright sunlight to a rain uh, to a complete storm. Um, which changed the atmosphere so drastically that the, there was a glass plate in front of me which shattered, which looked like I had designed it to happen. But um, <laughs> in terms of that particular site was transformed completely, even within the space of the poem. So it, it's a really good question. And I'm afraid my answer is less than good, but um, thank you for asking it, it was really helpful. No, thank you, Holly. Oh, no, we have another question. So um, Emma's asked, I would think that I visualise muscles as something that's usually in a group or large numbers. Um, you're absolutely right. They grow in beds. Um, and I think uh, there's a difference here between the, the thinking of the bivalve as, as alive when you find it in a, a particularly... Um, freshwater pearl mussels growing banks and um and then the encounter with the shell which is something that you might find washed up alone partial perhaps you might find only one half of the bivalve you find only one valve um and this project started with thinking about shells and the collection of shells and the way that poets and philosophers think about shells not necessarily of the animal the bivalve that inhabits the shell so, um, but you're absolutely right, Emma, that um, as an animal, they're very, um, very much a multiple, not solitary at all. Um, and yeah, it, it, exactly. It, it comes to be a question of, of um, what are the effects of species loss? What do we, what, I suppose, what are we left with? And, and why do we enjoy collecting um, beautiful objects? Um, these iridescent interiors that effectively are a cast of um, death <laughs> to be to be fairly morbid, but yes. That's a really wonderful um, connection with Borges. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, um, and Sally Ann's asked a question of could your poem be used to raise awareness? Um, certainly the question of what poems that can be useful for is really um, 
important one and just um talking about it talking about the um wonders of the freshwater pearl mussel i could talk about them for a very long time <laughs> so, and i'm aware that jane will be keeping an eye on the clock but certainly i um um yes the poems as a way of talking about a way of exploring our responses to and our hopes against um species loss or a way of talking about um whether or not we might think of that as raising awareness but it's a way of talking um and yes i don't know if that answers your question Saya. okay i'm going to draw this to a close um thank you so much holly I shall certainly look at mussels, humble mussels on the beach in a, in a slightly different way next time I'm, I find them. Well, um, I should point out that the wild blue mussels that you find on the beach aren't, aren't able to produce pearls. They're a different, a different type of mussel. Ah. Um, but <laughs> okay. but uh, and with different lifespans, in there, but they're also, uh, uh, again, I could talk about them for a while, so I'll stop there, but yes. <laughs> okay thank you thank you so much holly it's been really thought-provoking and really interesting so i'm very very glad thank you and thanks and to thank you thank you questions. to the audience for, for for coming out on this rather <laughs> rather damp and miserable evening um thank you holly okay. thank you so much thank you everybody